and we're live <laughs> thanks for coming i'm tim van milligan you are watching roxim live i am like a second early today which is really unusual um, i've got a monitor over here what i am looking at when i'm looking off to the side um, looking at uh, any of the comments you're welcome to make a comment um okay so let's get started ah where are we where are we where are we let me switch screens switch screen screen this one there we go so this is my desktop um, i always start out by giving you a little bit of you know where you can find roxim and how to learn Roxim, because well, that's what we're doing here. We're talking about the Roxim software. Um, if you go to the ApogeeRockets.com website, um, you'll notice this banner right here. You can click on the Roxim 10 banner. Uh, what else do we got here? We got a newsletter. Uh, we have the launch visualizer that we can also talk about the launch visualizer. That's so much fun to play with. Um, but if you click on the Roxim link, it will take you to um, the latest news on Roxim, which says Roxim 10 is available. And this was from June of last year. Um, and down here, there's a free trial version you can download. If you're ready to order it, click on that link. If you have version 9, you get a free upgrade to version 10. Um, there's still some people out there that haven't taken advantage of the free upgrade. So hopefully that, uh, uh, you know, you'll, you'll take advantage of that because it's so cool to play with 10. Um, if you have version 8, and version 8 you do have to have a, there is a small upgrade fee. Version 9 is free, but version 8, version 9 was put out 10 years ago. Um, and version 8 was even longer than that. That's why we have an upgrade fee for version 8. So that's where you can upload it or uh, download it. Um, if you go here to how to and guides and come down here to software, this menu right here has a lot of information about Roxim. Like here's the free trial again, where you can purchase frequently asked questions. Um, recently I've been updating these links. For some reason these links got wrong. <laughs> they were pointing to the wrong things. Like what can you do with Roxim if you would have clicked on that? Um, you wouldn't have gone to this page. Um, this has 30 different things that teachers might use Roxim for. Um, let me go back to that. So how to and guides, go to software. Um, that's what I clicked on. What can you use Roxim? Here's system requirements. Uh, version history. Uh, speaking of version history, uh, this is the, you know, I've been keeping a track of everything that we've changed since version 2 came out. Um, right now on version 10.3. And so here's the changes in 10.3. 10.3.1 um, uh, F4. That's the latest one that we're currently running. Um, we fixed a bug where the program would crash when loading a rocket with a ringtail. Uh, before that was version 10.3.0. Um, and you can read all the fixes that we did there. We're on the <laughs> fourth bug fix for Roxem. So each each time we go from um, the main main thing is the, the main version is version 10. And then the minor version is version 3. So this is, that means this, there's been four enhancements. So new features to version 10 um, that tells you that, you know, this is how many feature revisions that we've done. And then this last number right here is bug fixes. So 10.3.0 um, to 10.3.1. So this version here tells us there was one bug fix that was um, created in that version. Um, there will be another bug fix version. It's going to be 10.3.2. Um, no, it's actually going to be 10.4.0 because when we release the bug fix, there's also some new features in there. 
So whenever we add a new feature, we're going to increase this number right there. Um, so there will be a new feature, and I might be able to show you the new feature. But what I wanted to tell you was when we, re when we release that, and hopefully we're going to do it next week. I was waiting for the programmer to give me the program today, but he says there was a delay because he lost his power. <laughs> so we'll do that probably next week. Um, but we're going to release it as a beta because w there's one bug that w we just can't find and fix it. And because it has that bug in there, I am reluctant to release it as a full version um, because I don't want to have people upgrade to it when there's a, a known bug that's still in there. And the bug is there's a, there's a random crash. It doesn't happen all the time. It just occasionally happens when, when you go from like one screen to another. Um, and hopefully we won't see it today, but it, it's one of those bugs, it, it's not consistent. If it was consistent, we could fix it. But it's not consistent, so we don't know where it's hiding. Um, so we're going to release it as a beta, and everybody can download it. Everybody that has version 10 can download it for free. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a, I'm going to pay you to find that bug. So if that bug happens for you and you are able to document it fully, and I will give you the procedure to document it fully. And if you, it has, we need, there's specific information that we need. And if you don't provide all the information, you're not getting the prize. And the prize is going to be money. So basically, I'm going to pay you to try to find this bug so that we can all smash that bug together, get rid of it, and move on. And then we'll release it as a full version for everybody. Ah, okay. So, wow, we got a lot of people joining in. We got Don Frieders. Carlos K. from cold Marietta, Georgia. Yeah, it's been a kind of a cold spring so far. Today, it's, it's got up to 60 degrees, and it's been like about seven days before since it's been 60 again. Uh, Fat Bank from Texas. Steve Brancato from Bishop, California. That's a new name. Steven, hello, Steven. Gerald K. is clapping his hands. Uh, and Fat Bank asks our first question. <laughs> um, he, and he asks, uh, hold, we're, we'll come back to that question. Um, let me uh, finish talking about this. So I talked about the new beta version that will, should be available next week. Um, we will probably announce it in the Peak of Flight newsletter. So if you're not a su subscriber to the Peak of Flight newsletter, Again, come to the home page and this banner bar right here, if you, there's arrows off to the left and the right, if you click on them, you'll get here to sign up for our newsletter. So you click on that um, and you can subscribe to the newsletter. It's free. We come out once a week on Tuesdays. Um, there's always some good content in it. Um, I am right now, right before this episode, I was busily away typing up next week's newsletter i'm going to show you how to put chrome on your fins um, I've, I've discovered a really cool method of putting chrome on fins uh, there's other ways to put chrome on fins like you could use decals and i know that but it's it's a different way and i think it looks just a little bit better um, and it doesn't hardly add any weight so if you got a competition rocket where weight is like really critical, which is how I discovered it, um, that's the method I use. Um, so every issue that we put out has good information. It's not just advertising. It's meant for you, help you become a better rocketeer, a better modeler, you know, and, and to grow the hobby. Um, and so it's my way of investing into your experience with rocketry um, so once you subscribe you'll be on the list um, and then uh, we'll we'll send you that notification that the newsletter is ready for download and there will also be some announcements like the announcement for the new beta version 
and things like that. Uh, there's also, you know, we, we announced new products in there. We don't have any new products to announce this week. Um, and we also do, there's a, there's a feature in the newsletter that I really like. It's the launch visualizer. And we call it the launch of the week, where um, I give you a link to a simulation at rocksim.com, and you just click on it, and it runs the simulation. So you can see exactly what I'm seeing, kind of like what you're doing now here. Ah, okay, so we got my mail that's chiming on me, so I'm going to quit that. Okay, um, okay, so that's that. Um, the pre these episodes that we're doing now, the Roxim Live episodes, to find the back episodes, again, go to the software under How To and Guides, and then come down here to Roxim Live Training. This is our archive of episodes. Um, there's just so much information here. Um, you can read, you know, what each episode has in it. And then, you know, you can watch the YouTube video exactly where we talk about it. Like this right here is the timestamp for that particular episode on that particular topic. Um, so you don't waste your time. You can just find out what you want to learn, go to it in the video, watch it, and you're done. You know, it's like... I'm going to be, you can, when you do that, you skip over all the stuff that I'm talking about now. <laughs> okay. Uh, I did have two questions that came in uh, via email, so I'll talk about those first. And the first one was from Gerald Kolb, and he asks, how do you select rocket engines? So let me first bring up a new design. Um, where's my rocket design file? Right here. It doesn't matter. I'll go here to the Lance Delta rocket. Okay, so here's a rocket. And over here on the screen is the recommended motors. And by default, it's empty. But uh, when you save your design file, it will save any new recommended motors. So I know nothing about this rocket. Say you know nothing about it as well. Uh, what rocket motors would work in this rocket? Now, some people might say, what's the best rocket motor? But we're not going for the best because I don't know how you define best. But we're going to give you a list of motors that will work, and then you can choose from there what you have in your range box or what mission you're trying to meet. Say you're trying to say, I want to go exactly to 800 feet. Well, I'll give you a list of rocket motors that will be safe, and maybe one of them will get close to 800 feet. So at that point, then you can just go through the list and you can find um, the maximum altitude. You'll see that here in this column. You just scroll through it until you find what altitude you want to reach. And so that is how you define best. Um, you know, it. it Best is how you define it, not how I define it. I just want to give you a list of safe motors that will work in the rocket. So you, do, you don't need to know anything about it. Um, what you do is first you come up here to the prepare for launch button. And what this icon shows is kind of like the bottom of the rocket. So if you're looking at the bottom of the rocket, let me take this out. So here's the bottom of the rocket. So that's what the icon looks. And then there's two arrows pointing down. One, two. And then underneath is the blast deflector. So that's what the icon shows. And we're going to click on that. That's kind of like getting it ready to launch. So I'm putting my rocket back onto the display stand there in the corner. All right. So that brings up this screen. Now, from here, there's a button here called Recommended Motors. So recommend the motors for me. Click on that, and it will bring up this screen. And all you have to do, again, is just click another button. You just click right here. So how many clicks was that? There's one, there's two, there's three clicks. And once you make that third click, you will get a list of recommended motors. And that's all you need to do. Now, what does this screen mean, though? Um, up here are recommended launch conditions. These are variables that could affect the flight. Um, now, if these variables look good, 
go ahead and just click this button right here. But if your launch conditions are different, say you take your laptop out on the field with you and your conditions are different. Say you're here in Colorado, instead of being at 700 feet altitude above sea level of your launch site, maybe you would be 5,000 feet, <laughs> which is what is our launch site. So then you'd have to change these recommended conditions. And I can show you how to do that, but first let me run the con run the simulation. Um, uh, this is going to take a long time um, because this rocket right here is a big rocket, and it's got 29 millimeter motor mount, and there are probably 160 to 170 rocket motors that are 29 millimeters in diameter. And what Roxim is going to do is it's going to run simulation with every rocket motor to, to verify that that motor will work. And because there's so many, I want to just like shorten the list. Um, if you want to shorten the list, you can come up here and say, okay, only run these specific manufacturers. So then I can choose one. So um, if I choose Aerotech, um, now it will eliminate all the Cesaroni motors, all the Apogee motors, all the Estes motors that are 29 millimeters. Um, and it's only going to use those. And um, I can further uh, narrow it down by saying, okay, only single-use motors. That's all I care about. I'm just going to run it with a single-use motor, not a reloadable, because I don't have a casing. So just you run Aerotech single-use motors and then use recommended conditions. And it's, there's 29 motors, I can see that, that it just ran. And now um, it, it runs the simulations twice. The first time it looks for um, all the conditions to make sure that it's going to work. And then the second time it runs through, now it's calculating the optimal delay. So what it says was there's 22 motors, you know, 22 out of 29. I don't know if you caught that when it was on the screen. Uh, that will work, and so let's find the optimal delay for those 22 motors. What's the optimal delay? The optimal delay is at where the ejection will occur right at the peak altitude called the apogee point. Um, so, so here is the list. So when it's done, it's going to repopulate this recommended motor chart. Um, and then the column you need to look at first is this one right here called Roxim Recommended. And so some of them are not recommended, some of them are recommended. Um, and if you only want to see the recommended motors, there's two things you can do. One is just click on the column header, and then it resorts them. So right now I put it all the not, not recommended ones on top, and then the recommended ones on the bottom. And you can reverse that order by clicking it again. So now all the recommended motors are on top. And if I scroll down, you'll find the not recommended motors down here at the bottom. Now, if you don't want to see any of these not recommended motors, what you do is you go up to the column and you right click on it with your mouse and it brings up this little menu. And you can see one of the options says show only recommended motors. So when I click that, um, so now if I, I go through the column, it only so shows the recommended motors. Okay, so the, these are the motors that it will work. So like the first one is an F25, and Roxim, Roxim says the optimal delay, so right at peak altitude would be 5.39 seconds. So if, if there was a delay available that was 5.39 seconds, that would be the perfect delay. But Aerotech in a single use doesn't make a 5.39 delay. So what we do in Roxim is we always choose the next delay, not the closest the delay, but the next closest that's below the, the time. And there's a specific reason for that. Um, this is my criteria that I use. So say the rocket goes up, instead of going straight up like we want, the rocket goes sideways. And now, you know, so say the next delay up was six seconds. So if the rocket goes sideways, it's going to be coming over the top and it's going to be coming downwards pretty high velocity when it ejects. 
So I would rather eject before Apogee than after Apogee. And that's why we select the next delay lower. Um, so that's my criteria for the optimal delay. So this is the column right here says recommended delay and optimal delay. Now you, you, your personal criteria might be different, um, but I'm selecting motors for newbies. And so for newbies, people that have never flown rockets before that don't have any experience with their rockets, you know, this is the delay I want them to use to be safe. But you might say, okay, I can live with the rocket going over the top just a little bit. And so a six second delay might be okay. Um, six seconds would be certainly closer than four seconds. Um, you know, six seconds is about 4.41 seconds. This is 1.39 seconds. So a six second delay would actually be closer. Um, I don't know what the, ex the next delay is. I'm just guessing. Um, to find out, you'd have to go like to the Apogee website, look in our motor charts and see if there's an Aerotech uh, F25-6. So you can come up here to F25, just type that in here, and you can see um, here what we have is a F25-4 and an F25-9. So there's no six seconds. So the four would be definitely what you would use. Okay, so let's go back here. Um, the other thing that uh, Roxim is looking at are these other criteria. Um, is the weather cocking safe? Does that mean is the rocket, when it ejects the parachute, um, is that parachute mostly like straight up, the, where the rocket is not weather cocking too much? Some rockets, um, the longer they burn and the lower the thrust, they just kind of lumber off the pad and then the wind starts making them weather cock. Um, and then they can become unsafe. And if it's unsafe, then you wouldn't get safe here. It would, it would say unsafe and then not recommended. Any of these criteria would, could trigger this to be not recommended. Um, then it's also looking at the liftoff speed, making sure that that liftoff speed is sufficient enough to where the fins can guide the rocket. Um, it's looking at 90 degrees safety. Um, that's making sure that the rocket, as it goes up, doesn't loop, because sometimes you can loop and the rocket continues going straight. Um, anytime that the rocket goes more than 90 degrees like this, automatically unsafe. Um, then it's also looking at the start static stability margin, um, which is the distance between the center of gravity and the center of pressure down here. And then it's finally looking for safe deployment. Does the parachute open at a speed at this recommended delay does it open at a speed that's slow enough that it's not going to shred the parachute? So that's what it's looking for when it says recommended. Um, if you like this list, you probably want to print it out. Um, and there's a couple ways you can do that. Um, I like my way that I like to do it is you right click on it and then you just say export table right here. And when you export it, it's going to create a an Excel spreadsheet that you can adjust the column widths because otherwise you're going to get all these columns and it might not have fit on a sheet of paper. Um, but if you export it and then print it from like Excel or Google Sheets, then it'll, it'll print the way it appears on your computer. So that's my favorite way. But then you can also come up here to the print menu and um, so you can see here, I can print the recommended motors table by this checkbox. And so that's another way to print it out. Um, I'll tell you a secret. These, um, this is the way that we create our own charts here at Apogee. So um, I've got, uh, what was that kit that we were just looking at? Uh, the Lance Delta. So you type it in on the Epigee website, you see the rocket, and you come here to the recommended motors. See this table? That table was generated doing exactly what I just showed you. Just three clicks of the mouse. So I just open the file, three clicks of the mouse, I got my table. <laughs> That's how easy it is. Um, 
you know, and, and what I do on this table is then I, uh, I, I, I note down the altitude and there's also the recommended delay. When it says see the motor, that means go over here and it says this is the motor, it says a G64W-7, so the delay would be the dash 7. Um, these other ones are reloads and you can tell they're reloads right here because it's telling you there's a reload casing and these say single use right there. Um, so when, they, when they're single use motors it will usually say see the motor for the delay but if it's a reloadable, in reloadables you're often adjusting the delay so this is that optimum delay. So just kind of explaining what, what, what goes on on the, the Apogee website. Ah, okay. All right, we got another question from Johan. No, it's not Johan. Yeah. <laughs> he says, oh boy, I'm drunk. Here comes my question. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. I got, okay, so this was Gerald Kolb's question. He was asking, how do you do recommended motors? So now, um, say you change something in your rocket, like you change the fin shape or you change the fin location that changes the design so you need to rerun the recommended motors so um, let's make a, a quick design change here um, i'm going to take this fin set here i'm going to edit the fin set so i brung up the editor and i'm going to change the size so i'm going to make them ooh, see what they did there i made it unstable <laughs> Yeah, this, this rocket's on the hairy edge of stability. So I made them bigger, so the, the, my static margin is still okay. It's marginally stable. It should still fly okay, but you never know. And if you never know, well, then you need to rerun the recommended motor. So I'm going to do it again. Um, come up here, prepare for launch. There's one click, two clicks, three clicks. And oh, this time it's running all 118 because I forgot to... Um, change the manufacturer type right down there. I don't know if you can see it. The manufacturer and the engine type. But it ran. Did it run or did I click the cancel button? I think I clicked the cancel button because that's definitely not all of them. Let me run it one more time. Recommended motors, Aerotech, Aerotech, single use, run. Okay, so there's 29 and it ran. Um, this time it's only seeing seven that it likes with the new fins. Okay, so that's why you have to rerun it. And notice that it, it purged the old recommended list, and now you have a new recommended motor list. So that's very important. Whenever you make a change to the design, changing the weight, changing the fins, changing the shape, you got to run a, a new set of recommended motors. Um, so... This is why Roxim is, is so much of a cost savings and so helpful. Okay. Uh, the second question that I got was um, from Ron Kaminsky. Um, and he sent me this design right here. Uh, I'm in Roxim Pro right now. Um, and it's the same as Roxim's um, as far as designing a rocket goes. Um, but he sent me this rocket, and it's a two-stage rocket. But if you look at it, if you look at the, well, let me let me yeah, come up here to show you that's a two-stage rocket. So if I click on this button right here, and I select, just show me the upper stage. You can see where he's got his fins located right here. I don't know if they'll stay attached, but assuming they stay attached, um, that's what the upper stage fins are. And then I add the bottom stage. And you can see that if you look closely, you have this fin nests into that fin. That's kind of a cool design. So it's kind of like a pocket where the fins go inside one or the other. And he was wondering, so what he did here on this design was he has just one big fin. It's a solid fin, and it goes over the top of that one. Um, and he was, his question is, how do I do that to make it actually two fins that are actually separated? Okay, so 
That is the question that I'm answering here. And so how do you go about doing it? Okay, so first what I want to do is I want to save the shape. So I'm going to go to the design components. And he has the booster fin right here. So I am going to copy that fin. I don't know if I need to copy it or not. Um, actually, I don't need to right now. So, um, so first, let's try to add the fin and I'll show you the problem that he is seeing. I know exactly what he's seeing. Um, he didn't even tell me, but I know what's going on. Um, so we're going to edit that fin. He says he wants to make the fins out of wafer glass, so really thin fiberglass. So it's kind of like one fin and that's to keep the drag low. Um, so so like uh, see right now he's got a thickness of 0.12 inches. So let's make this 0 0.02 inches. Okay, so now I, 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 I don't know if you saw that, but the center of gravity shifted because I made the fins thinner. And he's got it made out of G10 phenolic. Um, okay. And if you look at it in 3D, if I look at it like this and I zoom in on it, um, it's, it's basically still too thick. Well, actually, I'm seeing red on both sides. So uh, whatever he's using here for the orange fin is thinner. So let me go see what the thickness of that is. Um, so that's this fin here, and he has 0 0.016 inches. So I need to make the bottom one also 0 0.016. So close that. I'm going to go back to the booster fins and 0 0.016. Hit tab, and now if I look at it, they're both the same thickness, and you know Roxim can't figure out which one should be on top. Should the yellow one be on top or the red one be on top? And that's why you're getting this kind of like leopard pattern here as it's moving around. So now both fins are the same. So now let's take this red fin and move it to the side of the yellow fin. So to do that, let's look at it from the bottom view. Okay, and uh, I'm going to go to the radial position tab right here. Let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. And I'm going to change the radial position. So, so what I'm looking at is right down here. I want to take this red one and move it off to the side just a little bit. Too much, too much. Let's try three degrees. 3.5. Okay, 3.5 degrees looks like they're now just not touching. But if you look at it from the top right here, what's going on is now we no longer have a pocket. We got a V. And if I put another fin on the other side, I'll have a V on the other side. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to copy the fin now. So I'm copying that red fin, and I'm going to repaste it onto the booster stage. So I'm just going to highlight it and right-click and hit Paste. And so now you see two fins, but they're both right on top of each other. It, it copied everything, including the location. So let's change this one to minus 3 degrees from the radial position, or minus 3.5. Hit Tab. You can see now we've got two fins, and we no longer have a pocket. So his question is, how do we make this a pocket? And there is a way to do that. It's kind of hard. Uh, but this is where you come to ask your hard questions, so we're going to answer that. Uh, I'm going to cancel that. Do I save my changes? No. And I'm going to delete this fin because it's um, not the way we want to do it. So I'm going to delete it and say yes. Okay, so now we're back to the original red fin and the orange fin or yellow fin. Um, so now the the fin is always perpendicular 
to the tube and that's why we're getting that V angle right there. What we need to do is to be able to adjust the angle that the fin attaches to the rocket and you can't do that from this radial position tab um, or the general tab. So how do we do it? Um, the way we do it is we got to add, we got to take this fin and attach it to something else and that something else is a pod. Um, so I'm going to click, uh, first I want to copy the fin, copy, and I'll actually cut it from the rocket. So I'm going to cut it from the rocket, really delete, I'm going to say yes. So now it's still copied to my clipboard. So if I wanted to, I could actually just put it back. So now we got this booster stage and we're going to add a pod. So I'm going to come over here to the pod. A pod is a placeholder. A placeholder is like these things right here, booster two and the sustainer, the, the upper stage. These are placeholders where we're adding parts to it. So we're going to add another component where we add parts to that other component. And that other component is called a pod. But you have to attach the pod somewhere. And we're going to attach it to this booster stage. And I click pod. So we added the pod. And it brings up the pod screen right now. And then just make it bigger so you can see it. So this blue circle with the cross through the middle is our the location of that pod. And right now you can't see, it's just attached to the side of the tube right here where that fin is. And if I look at it from the side view, it's attached right here where the booster, the front of that booster tube. Okay, so the location is fine. We're just going to leave it alone for right now and click OK. Now we're going to attach the fin to the pod. So remember, it's still copied to my clipboard, so I can paste it to the pod. So I'll just click, right click and hit paste. And it attached that fin. And it was a fin set. So I don't know if you can see this or not, but um, there's actually a fin set attached to the rocket right there. Um, so now let's edit that and let's first, let's get, a, get rid of, you know, the multiple fin, fins in this set. So let's change it from a fin shape, a count of three to there's a two and there's a one. So now we just have one fin attached here. Now you can see it pretty good. Let me uh, go into the, the base view. So now it's, it's still attached right there, okay? So now we need to move it to the right location. So I'm gonna click OK here. Let me go back to my base view. So there's that fin. So to adjust the location, I'm gonna adjust the location of the pod. We were just talking about the location of the pod, so let's adjust it. So we're looking at the base view. See if I can make that bigger. Okay, I can. And let me see if I can move it down. Okay, so I'm going to adjust the radial position. We'll start there. And um, I can see that I can do that. <laughs> when I when I move it around, you can see it's it's kind of floppy because um, it's 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 perpendicular to the part that it's attached to, which is the pod. Um, so first I want to kind of move it where I think it should be. And with the cross in the middle, it's kind of hard to see. So here's my fin. And here's the pod location right here at the, the intersection of the blue lines. And then here's my original fin. So now I want to swing the fin back to vertical. So I'm going to click OK here. So I kind of, right now, I just kind of move the base off to the side. Now I want to change the fin angle. So now I'm going to go back to the fin. And now I'm going to adjust the radial position. So now when I adjust the radial angle, let me see if I can make that bigger. Ooh, I can. Ooh, I made it too big. Oh, oh no, I lost my fin. 
That has never happened to me before. Cancel there. Let's see if I can get it back. There we go. I, I moved the, see this little circle right here? On Windows, it doesn't have the little circle, but um, if you click, and you can click and drag that. And right now it doesn't want it. There we go. See, I, I can drag the size. Um, you can drag it up to a certain point, and then at that point, if you drag it further, it will jump and then fill the whole screen. And I didn't want to do that. <laughs> um, so right now, here it is. But then I can zoom in and, and drag that around. So what I'm looking for now is I want to adjust this angle. And if I, if I swing this around, this dial indicator right here, watch the fin, it will rotate. Okay, so now I got it almost vertical. It's pretty close, but now it's too far away from the original fin. So now it's not touching the fin. So now I got to go back to the pod and adjust it there. So I'm going to click OK, go back to the pod, and go back to the radial position here. And I'm zooming in. So here's the fin I want to adjust. I'm going to adjust this angle right here. Let's call it 4 degrees and see what happens. Ooh, 4 degrees is like perfect. I have just a little bit of space. You know, you're going to need a little space where they can slide out. Maybe there's a fin fillet down in there, and so if, if they were like right touching each other, the fin fillets would get in the way. But it, you can see that here at the top, the fin is actually overlapping. So now I got to go back to the fin and move the fin's radial, radial position around. So go back to the fin, radial position. I'm zooming in because I want to be able to see it. Make it as big as I can. Um, radial angle 0.5. Ooh, that's pretty close. I can still see it's just too far. How about 0.4? How about zero? Oh, zero was perfect. <laughs> Okay, so now this fin is parallel to that fin. And click OK. Let's look at it in 3D. And uh, reset, sent, reset the camera. So looking at the side. If I look at it now, you know, I can see on this side, you know, it's yellow and red. And if I flip the rocket over, on the back side, it's red and yellow. Okay, so now, now I've got the fin right, but now I need um, one, two, three, four, I need five more instances of this fin, but now I can just do a copy and paste. So now you've done the hard part when you got to this point. Although um, we need to move this fin forward. So I'm gonna do that by adjusting the pod location. Um, I want to see a side view. And then the location right here. See I moved the fin over the top of that other fin. It's pretty close. You can be as exact as you want. Okay, so that's pretty close right there. And click OK. So now those fins should be like almost on top of each other. You can see I'm not, if I look at it from this side, I'm not seeing any yellow. And if I'm looking at it from this side, I'm not seeing any red. But I look at it from the bottom. Yeah, they're parallel. They're, they're nice. Right there. Okay, so now let's do copy and paste. So here is um, this pod. I'm going to copy the pod, copy, and I'm going to paste it. Paste. 
So remember, when you ever do copy and paste, it copies and pastes the, the location as well. So here's the first one, here's the second one. I'm going to edit the second one, and I got to edit the, the radial angle. And let's look at it from the base. So here's both fins are right here. Um, so I'm going to move this second one. I'm just going to I'm just going to reverse the sign. So instead of being four degrees, I'm going to make it a minus four degrees. Hit the tab. You can see it jumped over. Click OK. And come up here to this radial position. See this? And make that zero because I remember the last one was zero. You can see it jumped right up, just like that. Perfect. Click OK. So now I have both fins. So now I have the pocket fin that uh, Ron, he wanted to see how to make the pocket fin, where both the fin is nested inside the fin. Um, so now you got to do that four more times. <laughs> Uh, you got to copy these pods four more times. Um, I'll do one more and then um, I'll let him figure out the rest. So I'm going to copy this one and then um, paste it. Paste. And again, when it pasted it, it pasted it right here on the side. And now we got to move it way over here. So I'm going to edit that pod. And the, the radial position. Um, so now these fins are 120 degrees apart. So I just need to add 120 degrees to this one right here. So it's going to be 124 degrees. And you can see that it moved it right over here. Click OK. That one was perfect. And if I do this one, this, this other pod, I um, change. Uh, I need to copy it first. Come on, I want to select this one. Copy. I do a right click on it to copy it. Come up here to the booster, paste, and here's the, the other pod. So now we got four pods. One, two, three, four. The fourth is the one we're going to edit. Uh, radio position. I'm just going to add 120 degrees to it. So it's now 124. <laughs> and it added it over here. Oh, because I had a minus. Um, if I make this um, a positive, you can see where it put it. It put it in the wrong spot. Um, so now I'm starting to lose track of my fin. So I, I changed it back to the upper stage so I can see where my main fin is. Come here to the bottom stage and it put it there. Um, so I need, let's, gonna, let's call it uh, minus eight. So it's uh, 112. Nope, that's not right. Um, 16, yeah, 116 degrees. And so now we have the pocket on that fin as well as the, this fin. So I've done it four times now, and so there's two more to go. I'm trying to rotate it around. If it doesn't want to rotate like you want, if it gets kind of jittery, go up here, just reset the camera so that the camera is looking right at the side. Click on closed. And now when I rotate it, you can see I got two pocket fins and then one fin without. So that is how you would make that pocket fin. Um, as far as stability goes, Roxim thinks now that booster stage will have six fins instead of four. So um, if, if the goal was to make a pretty rocket, this is what we just did. If the goal is to make an accurate simulation, we probably didn't get there because now instead of three fins, we've got six fins. And so you got six fin stability instead of three fins. And the only way to get back to three fin stability is 
to have just three fins. Um, so the original way that you had the rocket run is probably okay for the simulations, but for weight and CG location, this will work as well. Um, if you want to have that first one, let me save this design file, save as, um, desktop, um, let's call it three, save. Let me see if I can get back to the original design where we had the big fat fins. There we go. Yeah, so this has the big fat fins. Um, so this, because they're fat, it's thinking there's a lot of material there. So if I go to the booster fins, um, see the thickness here is 0.12 inches. Uh, and before he had 0 0.016, it was thinner. Um, but you remember, for a pocket fin, we got two of those. So this this is actually the correct the correct way. So you take 0 0.016, multiply it by two. So 16 and 16 is 0 0.032. So that would be the actual weight of that fin set. That's a heavy fin set. Maybe it's 0 0.032. Yeah, that's better. So 2.39 seven grams. So the way you did it is actually good, um, except for what, because you have a fat fin, it's going to change the drag of the rocket. So what you would probably do is you'd have to co adjust the coefficient of drag of the booster stage. But in reality, uh, I don't think it's worth the effort <laughs> because booster stages don't stay attached to the rocket very long. Um, on this particular rocket, he has an A10-0 in the booster stage. And if we look at the burn time of an A10-0, um, load engines. Um, so I, I reloaded the engines. Did I? How come I'm not seeing? Load engines. Yeah, the engines are in there. Recenter camera. Um, and if I click on the A10-0, bring that open, I can look here at the burn time, 0.85 seconds. That booster stage on that rocket is only going to be attached for 0.85 seconds. It's probably not producing enough drag to affect the simulations. So that's why I say it's probably not worth it to adjust the drag coefficient for a booster stage, uh, particularly if it's a zero second delay where it's going to kick off right away. Now, if it was hanging with the rocket, say it uses a, you know, a five second delay, A10-0, so I got to go five seconds. So in this configuration, the A10 is going to hang on to the stage for five seconds. Um, let's look at a flight profile. I don't know where I'm launching from. Um, max ejection delay, max ejection delay, starting state. We're going mostly vertical. Let's see a flight profile. This is Roxin Pro. Um, so in Roxin Pro, we'll see a 3D. Ah, no, we won't. <laughs> the booster stage is not there for some reason. What the heck is going on? My booster stage is not showing up. Let's try it one more time. Um, prepare for launch. Flight profile. Uh, no, it's not working. <laughs> I don't know 
know why it's not working. Anyway, um, what I wanted to show you was that booster stage uh, hanging with the rocket for a long period of time. Um, what I can do is save this. I'll save as. Um, let's put it on the desktop. Let's call it version 4. Save. Let's open it in the launch visualizer, see if I can run it there in the launch visualizer. And the launch visualizer is rocksim.com. Okay, your session has expired. Log in. Sign in. Boy, I mean, this this is a long topic here. This is an intense topic. This is a fun topic. <laughs> Upload a new design. Browse. Fin with oops. Desktop. Number four. Click OK. Upload. Was added. So we should see the rocket here. So now I can see them both on the pad. Let's add the motors. Um, let's choose a launch site. Um, doesn't matter. Let's go Toronto in our section 780. Never launched from there before, so this is a first for me. Let's see what this launch site looks like. Oh boy, I see a lot of trees. <laughs> It's somebody's house. And now I'm looking for a park. Don't want that. That's water. Okay, look, look there's, there's more open land over here. So let's go over here. That looks like that's a nice big field right there. Confirm the launch site. So that's where we're launching from. We got, um, we want to kind of land to the northwest. So let's angle the rocket, point it towards the northwest a little bit. Let's add our motors. So um, upper stage is an A3-6. And the booster stage is an A10-5 custom. So I'm trying to set up the simulation the way I wanted to. Click OK, um, and then let's uh, launch. So now on this, the booster stage should be going up with the upper stage. OK, come on. Do not close the browser window. What's going on? Usually it's not this slow. We can come back to that. Let's go to the questions. Our first question that came in was from Fat Bank in Texas. He says, will Roxim have a search feature in the parts database? Um, a search feature. Man, oh man. So what he's talking about is if you go to design components and you add a new part, um, like an inside tube, is there a search feature in this box? And the answer is no. <laughs> That's a really good idea, though. Um, but the, the question is, what are you going to search on? Are you going to search on part number, um, search on description? You know, when everything is called body tube, it makes it really hard to find. Um, but there's really no reason we couldn't have a search feature. I'll, I'll add it to the list of wish items. Um, so it currently does not, the, the beta version that we're coming out with will not because it's still in, um, in my mind. Uh, okay, Johan says, question anyway, what is the max volume of a body tube a D 12 Estes can eject. Okay, so that is a very hard question. Uh, okay, we're back to the launch visualizer and I, it didn't run it. 
They didn't like that simulation. <laughs> I gotta go talk to the programmer. I've got a lot to talk about. Okay, so volume that, so, so basically you have a D12 motor in your rocket um, and it has an ejection charge. So what is the largest volume that, that can be reliably ejected of your parachute? Um, say you like had an Estes mean machine, like you know, we, we talked about that. It's a big, long rocket. It's, you know, over six feet long. That's this mean machine. Um, this rocket, you know, look how big it is. It's like six feet, seven inches tall. Um, and a D12 can lift this rocket, and one of the motors is a D12-3. Um, so what's the volume that could be reliably ejected so the parachute comes out. Um, so the way to figure this out, this is not a Roxim um, solution. This is, you got to figure it out. Um, so you, let's first look at the Estes D12. So I'm going to rocket motors. It's a 24 millimeter um, Estes motor. That's Estes accessories, Estes motors. Um, 24 millimeter. Here's the C11 D12. Okay, so here's the D12. Let's open it up. Okay, so what we're looking for should be down in the frequently asked questions. Um, no. <laughs> Uh, I swear we had it. Um, let's look at the E12, see if it's on the E12 page. I'm looking for the frequently asked questions. Nope, it's not there either. Um, let's look. Uh, Aerotech motors. Let's go E20. Uh, frequently asked questions. Okay, here it is. Okay. How much black powder is in an ejection charge? Um, uh, I, I swear we had the Estes motor in here. Uh, first, the first thing you got to know is how much ejection charge is in the rocket engine. Um, for the Aerotech and the Cesaroni motors, we have the amounts listed. So like the, the Pro 24 is 0.6 grams of black powder. The Pro 29 is 1.2. Um, I swear we had, that's why I was looking on the Estes D12 page to see if it was listed there. I don't know where it went. Um, so you, you, you need to know that first. And if, if you don't know it, and if you can't find it on the Apogee website, and if it's not on their website, don't call me up because I don't know. <laughs> you're going to either have to measure it yourself, which is going to be kind of hard because they're single-use motors and you're not supposed to modify a single-use motor, or you're going to have to call up Estes. And I would, I would recommend calling Estes and say, hey, how much ejection charge is in a D12 motor. And then once you know, my guess, it's going to be somewhere around 0.5 grams. That's just my guess based on what's in the Aerotech 24 millimeter motor. <clears throat> They're probably pretty similar. So once you know the ejection charge amount, then you need to use an ejection charge calculator. And you'll just go to your internet browser and you'll type in ejection charge, e ejection charge calculator. And you'll see there's all kinds of them. Um, BP estimator, I'll try that one first. Um, and it gives you the formulas that you need. Um, So this one has a little 
little tube. So here, let's let's say the inner diameter on a tube um, on a on a 24 millimeter motor. Well, I don't know what the inner diameter is. It's going to depend on your rocket. Uh, let's let's call it three inches, uh, and the tube length is 42 inches. And it tells me below is the calculated BP amount. It tells me point uh, one point two one grams. So I need to change. I need I need to change this or this so that my ejection charge in grams is the amount that's in the rocket motor. So let's say this is two inches. And see, now the ejection charge went down to 0.54 grams. So now we're like pretty close. So if your body tube was two inches in diameter and 42 inches long, the D12 would probably do it just fine. Um, the um, mean machine, let's say it was uh, 72 inches that it has to pressurize uh, not 72 inches long and a diameter of 1.6 inches. Um, that would work, 0.59 grams. That would pretty close. Um, that gives me 8 psi of ejection charge pressure putting, pushing it off. That's probably the lowest you want. So that is how you would figure out how big of a rocket you can have that the ejection charge in the rocket motor will still push out the parachute. It's not a Roxham answer, it's an ejection charge calculator answer. Oh, okay. Fat Bank says that is a unique design. I think he's talking about the, um, the one from Ron. Uh, Art, Art Applewhite says howdy from Kerrville, Texas. Um, and Giorgio, Giorgio Luyo, he says, what is this? This is Roxim Live, <laughs> where we talk about the Roxim software where you can design model rockets. That's what this is. That's what we're all about here. Um, we're out of time. We went our full hour as typical. In fact, we went seven minutes over. Um, Johan says, thanks very much for your answer to my non roxim related question, Tim. Maybe an idea to add to the program. Yes, that would be pretty cool to add that to the program. Um, it would be pretty hard though. We need to figure out, we need to figure out what is the volume that we're trying to pressurize. And it might require a bit more user input than than you might think because of placement of where the rocket motor is. You know, if you have a stuffer tube that goes up the inside of a, of a big tube, so you have a big tube like that big, and then you got the rocket motor tube this big, but if that's the rocket motor, motor mount tube is like really long, um, now we're only pressurizing a little bit of volume compared to the entire volume of the rocket. So that's where it gets really hard. Ah, okay. <laughs> so thanks for coming. We'll be back next week. Um, next Today is what day? Let me look at my calendar here. So today is April 8th. Next week will be April 15. Um, so we'll be here at 2 p.m. Mountain Time, Daylight Savings Time, which is 4 p.m. on the East Coast. Um, yeah, and we'll be back. So until next week, go out and launch something. So I'm going to end the stream in five, four, three, two, one, launch. <laughs>